only two search levels in this version. No, we tried on the one to one. This is the other stream. Yeah, so they will have all the heavy components here. We're going to close that. She's, uh, she's, she's working on those two. Yeah. Okay, it's streaming on the long YouTube. Hello. Maybe that was
Hello. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. sorry, sir. Very sorry. Actually, there was network issue at my home, so. Okay, Just... so are we all ready to go? Am I visible now? I'm sorry? Am I visible now? Hello? Hi, this is Jason. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is Krishna. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. On the behalf of Team Footprints, I, Krishna Patil, the core committee member of Footprints, welcomes you all. First of all, I would like to thank our title sponsor, IMS, and Kaleidoscope uh, sponsor, uh, Textel, for their event support. In the Kaleidoscope segment, we have successfully conducted three guest lectures virtually, and today we are with one of the world's thought leaders in sustainable design, Professor Jason Pramay, sir. He has authored, uh, he is uh, an award-winning architect and academic, fo academic founder of sustainable design uh, research and uh, founder of research firms and uh, Pomeroy Studio and Pomeroy Academy. He has authored the book named Cities of Opportunities, Connecting Culture and Innovation and many more. He has hosted TV series named Smart Cities, City Time Traveler, City Redesign and Future Police. We have Jason Pamre, sir, with us. Welcome to Footprint, sir. Uh, now I request participants to keep patience during the session. And yes, we have putting one link in the chat box. So if you have any questions to ask uh, to Jason, sir, you can fill that form. And yes, sir, now I request uh, Jason, sir, to take the stage. So can we start the session now? Thanks very much, Krishna. And uh, everybody, uh, it's lovely to be here today. Uh, my name is Jason Pomeroy, I'm the founding principal of Pomeroy Studio. Allow me to share the slides now. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is talk about culture, innovation, and its influence on smart cities. Now, oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface. Deserts take up slightly over 10%, and cities only cover 3% of our planet. And yet, cities account for 50% of the global population who have been living there since 2007. And by 2050, 75% of our global population will be living in cities. Now, that has some serious cataclysmic effects. I mean, there's overcrowding, there's waste pollution, there's traffic congestion. And if we want to continue enjoying life in cities and not live in gridlocked urban slums, then cities have to become more efficient and more sustainable. And arguably that'll be the crux of this particular lecture, which is also the subject of many a TV series that I've done too. Ultimately, cities have to be smarter. So what is a smart city? If you were to think about the dictionary definition of smart, it's often relying on words like clean and tidy and stylish, but it also can relate to being intelligent or things to be done quickly or working with the computer. And what we need to bear in mind is that smart cities have arguably been around for a lot longer than our technological era that we're all too used to today. There has been an element of smartness in every single one of the previous generations of city, whether it's the traditional cities of Rome, which looked at space smarts, using open space as the arteries of our movement, or the modern city that was looking at smartness in terms of um, arteries for automobile movement or the reliance on air conditioning and artificial lighting, or even smartness when it comes to the garden city movement and the ability to move industry out into the suburbs and coat them and um, cr uh, create boundaries of green open space that would allow the people to enjoy a connection to nature. Today's smartness often refers to the network of cities that um, many a global academic like Saskia Sassen has been waxing lyrical about. And when we speak to our kind of compadres about what they think a smart city might be, 
well, often people start to think about bicycle sharing schemes and talking fridges and driverless cars and surveillance and to the point of um, big data acting as big brother. In my TV series, Smart Cities, I visited various different smart cities around the world. I went to Songdo in Korea, Shenzhen in China, Higashi Matsushima in Japan, Amsterdam in Holland, Barcelona in Spain, and Bandung in Indonesia. And I went on a quest to find out what a smart city is. Now, what we can see are certain generations of a smart city, and the early generations of a smart city, the first generation, often was quite technology-centric. Batty in 2012 said that cities in which ICT is merged with traditional infrastructures coordinated and integrated using new digital technologies was the defining moment for a smart city. But later we also see Carol Yu talking about urban performance. It often depends not only on a city's endowment or hard infrastructure, but also increasingly so on the availability and quality of knowledge, communication, and social infrastructure. So a maturity of the smart city that goes beyond the technology, but also takes into mind uh, the human element and the social cultural element. We could also see through Peak and Stan's research that it is also an opportunity for smart cities to be a bit of an incubator a bit of a knowledge and innovation hub that can spur the economy, an economic stimulus to the broader city in order to grow a new base of jobs, to adjust to industrial change or leverage technology to address sustainability, resilience and social cohesion. So let's look at three particular case studies and what I would call three generations of a smart city. And at the end, I'll basically highlight what my observations are. In terms of Songdo, what we find in this ubiquitous first generation smart city is something akin to having a blank piece of paper and being able to create a city from scratch, an instant noodle city where you can just add water and within three minutes, you've got a ready meal. Now Songdo is 12 kilometers from Incheon International Airport. It's a quite a remarkable place that's been built through reclaim a reclamation of land. And its central business district, the Songdo IBD, is approximately six kilometers square. Now, part of the Incheon Free Economic Zone is Songdo. Songdo being uh, characterized as an international business and high-tech industry place. Uh, alongside Cheongna for finance and leisure and Yongjong for logistics and tourism. And these three districts come together to form the free economic zone of Incheon. So what characterizes Songdo as this first generation ubiquitous smart city? Arguably, one of the major elements is the use of big data. Sensors placed throughout the city collect extremely large data sets of information that can be computer, computationally analyzed to reveal patterns and trends and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. And this has included the trialing of motion tracking where vitamin information pertinent to missing persons is readily available. So if a child goes missing, you can be pretty sure that they will be able to be found, given this motion tracking. It does obviously bring to mind certain issues relating to personal privacy. Though. And talking about personal privacy and surveillance, we can see that the central operation centre is ultimately acting as big brother. The IOCC collects the big data sets from sensors in real time, and is capable of identifying and managing incidents happening in the city, such as malfunctioning infrastructure or waste or uh, fires or electricity sort of going down or, or the quality of water or traffic congestion or crime. Authorities are then able to respond immediately to those requests and actually have a plan of action to remedy those incidents in real time. 
We also see the embrace of smart technologies, whether that is using large corporations like Cisco to embed intelligent parking solutions or health applications or just being able to monitor your day-to-day -day consumption in your home. We also see waste management being a particularly important feature of the smart city. By 2020, the city sought to recycle 40% of its water and 76% of its waste. Now its pneumatic trash system manages the city's public bins, household and commercial refuse, and efficiently, uh, efficiently sort of separates the waste out into these sort of seven collection points where there is wet waste and dry waste. And the dry waste is compacted and turned into energy that can then supplement uh, the energy provision for the offices and the residents in this place. All of this waste is basically transported around a rather remarkable network that's 55 kilometers long worth of pipe work, which effectively allows the city to continue to function. It also has some quite remarkable smart remote learning opportunities where you can be at home and be able to get day-to-day -day instructions in Korean or English or even just painting and uh, <laughs> undertaking various forms of art. Interestingly enough, a lot of people moved out of, out of Seoul, the capital, and into Songdo for that element of learning. Songdo has become this knowledge hub through the establishment of a remarkable secondary and tertiary education system, such as the Chadwick International School, where coding and ICT feature heavily in the curriculum from the age of seven years old. So we can see actually that people were not necessarily embracing um, technology as the defining factor of Songdo, but actually it was more about knowledge sharing and it being an education hub that was in a clean and green environment. So what are those major observations from this first generation smart city? Well, Songdo as a first generation smart city where the investment of private developer like um, POSCO and various large technology companies like Cisco supported a strong government mandate to transform its national economy from a manufacturing based one to a green and low carbon based economy. And this was effectively built on a platform that was very technology focused. Arguably what we see in this first generation smart city and many of the smart cities that followed was that technology and economy was central to the theme new technologies that could help stimulate the local economy was often driven through a government top-down approach. Now that obviously leads us to the second generation smart city and that comes in the form of Bandung as a case study. Now Bandung has been heralded as the Paris of West Java once upon a time, it was a place where many of the colonial would actually go to retreat and escape the hustle and bustle, the choke and heat of the city and actually end up in the comfier, cooler climes of the hills of Bandung. But over time, we've seen population growth and traffic congestion start to create a slightly different view of Bandung. This is what Bandung looked like in the early 20th century, quite low rise, set amongst the hills, quite a beautiful place. But Bandung has transformed and from 1970, where there was 100,000 people to 2017, where there were 2.5 million, with a projected growth to 4.1 million by 2030, we're starting to see Bandung suffer and its uh, utilities and infrastructure be stressed and strained. So Bandung had to get smart in a particularly innovative way. And it wasn't necessarily like what we see in Songdo, where the government push through technology to revitalize the economy allowed for certain expenditure to take place. Bandung had to do it far more economically. 
And what they did, they tapped into a very young, youthful, entrepreneurial crowd. They tapped into the startup community. The startup community made up of hackathons and incubators was very much a civic driven movement that hosts countless startups, initiatives, hackathons and incubators by techno entrepreneurs, evangelists and volunteers aiming to create a thousand startups in Bandung by the end of last year. And all of this was very much a citizen driven co-creation means for the people to have their voice in the city. Now, this also relates to big data because it's the voice of the people and not necessarily the government that made an impact. The Bandong Command Center, a central digitalized command center, not too dissimilar to the IOCC that you see in Songdo, is the city's digital monitoring facility that collects big data sets in a variety of sectors in order to improve the city's operation and governance. Now, information is collected and relayed to the command center through a series of CCTV cameras and GPS devices installed on public vehicles. But in addition to that, there is a huge play on citizens giving their information, giving their feedback through social media, which allows the trending topics to be sifted through using very complex algorithms. It also allowed for the citizens to put forward smart ideas through various smart applications. For instance, applications with regard to mobility. Kiri is one particular example. It's a public transportation application which provides people with a convenient travel means to understand the various public transportation networks, therefore saving both money and the environment simultaneously. Now, these green buses that you see here are called ANCOTs, and they basically roam around the city with no fixed place to uh, stop and start, but they can basically be jumped upon by any citizen as and when necessary. So if you have the Kiri app, you'll be able to track in real time where these buses are for you to jump on and jump off and thus help ease congestion. Now, another factor was a very forward looking mayor, Mayor Ridwan Kamil, who basically implemented some form of e-governance. E-governance permits the two-way communication between citizens and service providers with an emphasis on convenience, transparency, and efficiency. And what that meant was that he was able to sift through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, trending topics that were celebrated by the people, and for him to then learn from the people in order to implement change. Thus, the people from bottom up approach, as opposed to a top down approach, were able to influence the city and use him as the voice. There's a lot of community engagement as well. There is a program for the 151 architects that support 151 sub districts. And that allows for effectively one architect per village that can effectively shape and form events and various happenings and various public utilities and, um, and various uh, piecemeal infrastructure like libraries and museums and galleries that could offer an element of social and cultural self-sustenance. So what can we observe from this second generation smart city? While Bandung acknowledges the place of ICT in shaping the local economy, it eschews the conventional government-driven approach of private corporation-backed technology companies in favor of something that is more citizen-centric a more community-driven engagement that seeks to employ the technology already in the hands of the people. He's basically, the, the male was basically empowering the seven-year-old child all the way through to the 70-year-old grandparent to be able to embrace technology, to make a contribution to civil society, and therefore to improve the city. For me, the Smart City 2.0 
is very much one that reacts against a top-down government-driven approach, but is far more citizen co-creative and a bottom-up approach that puts society and culture center stage. So what about the third, the example that we see in, say, Amsterdam? Amsterdam is home to 1.1 million people, so it's quite a shrink in violence when compared to places like Songdo and Bando. But ultimately, for me, Songdo, Bando are great, but Amsterdam is the cool kid of smart cities. And what I love about Amsterdam is that it's not just smart, but it's really embracing the circular economy. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that it's really looking at waste in smart ways, really trying to push the limits on what we can do with all of our waste and produce. Amsterdam's embrace of the circular economy is evident at various scales. If you take the mega scale of Amsterdam Arena, they've taken 148 used Nissan Leaf batteries from cars, too degraded for automotive use, and they've basically used them as a means of energy storage to act as a stable power supply for the stadium. The 2.8 megawatt hour system has the capacity to store energy from the grid or from the 4,200 solar panels on the arena's roof. I also love the various innovation labs that take place. They're really using Amsterdam as this hub for innovation, this living laboratory. The Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Systems contains an intersectoral exchange of ideas wherein science, education, government, and business partners, and societal organizations work in close collaboration to create solutions for the complex challenges faced by the metropolitan region of Amsterdam. They're very focused on resilience planning. After all, Amsterdam and the Netherlands, which actually means the lowlands in Dutch, is constantly at risk from water, whether it's you know, torrential rainfall or whether it's rising sea levels and the potential for flooding. So the technology orientated water management agency called Waternet maintains an online portal where citizens can pay tap water bills and keep informed of flood protection initiatives such as the Amsterdam Rainproof Program a scheme that uses polder deck roof gardens, which serves as a means of water collection, water storage that can then be used for irrigation. I also love what they're doing when it comes to mobility. After all, they've got a remarkable road infrastructure and rail infrastructure, but also a water canal infrastructure. Rowboat is a joint five-year project conducted by researchers from MIT Sensible City Lab Delft University and also Wageningen University in collaboration with the Amsterdam Metropolitan Solutions Institute. It is the world's first large scale research into autonomous boats that can effectively be used as floating vessels for not only um, package delivery, but also a personalized mobility system. Also waterborne urbanism. If you kind of consider the fact that 50% of the surface area of Amsterdam is actually water, if you to consider then two thirds of the surface area of the earth is water, why wouldn't you use water as an alternative means of urbanization? What we see in Eierberg is this remarkable floating community that is being built out onto this underutilized dock and ultimately, this provides an alternative means of housing that escapes the need for expensive housing in city centers, but provides something that is also resilient to rising sea levels. What can we observe from Amsterdam? Well, I guess it's the third generation smart city. Its embrace of ICT and big data is good, but it augments city participation, citizen participation with the inclusion of academia, private corporations, 
and government in the fostering of city-specific innovations. Its ability to enable multiple stakeholders to use the city as a living laboratory has allowed a culture of innovation to flourish. So in conclusion, what we've seen is Songdo as a first generation, ultimately a city that is all about big technology to uh, supplement and grow the national economy and is often seen as a top-down approach. We've seen Bandung, which arguably builds upon the notion of technology and economy, but also starts to think very carefully about societal contribution and the importance of local culture. To Amsterdam, that takes into account the notions of um, culture, of, of society, of technology, of the economy, but also takes into account pressing issues relating to climate change and the various um, issues relating to trying to keep a cap on temperatures and rising sea levels, but it also embraces space very wisely. Here we see both a top-down and a bottom-up approach to these two parameters. I would argue that not only do you need to take into account those six pillars of sustainability and arguably go beyond the triple bottom line of social, economic and environmental parameters to also embrace space, culture and technology as equally important elements if we were to create a truly smart and sustainable city. But you also need to think of governance models. And that means thinking about the importance of civil society defining the needs and aspirations of the people. That can be then tested, researched, developed by academia. That can then be effectively championed by private corporations through proof of concepts. That can then be ratified by state through regulatory and governance models. If you have these four spheres of influence of civil society, state, academia, and private corporations all working in unison with a common goal to create a culture of innovation. And if you then start looking over the garden fence to what your peers are doing and benchmark against other global cities, then I think you're in a right place to create a truly smart and sustainable city. That won't just be a generation three, but will be moving towards a generation four. These are subjects and subject matter that I covered in my recent book, Cities of Opportunities, Connecting Culture and Innovation, as published by Routledge, and will soon be turned into a TV series with Matt Gia. Thank you very much, everybody, and I'm open to hear your wonderful questions. Thank you so much, sir, for the session. Uh, we got to know about sustainable cities and smart cities, et cetera. So, so can we proceed towards question and answer session now? Sure. Yes. Sir. So the first question from the participants is how to utilize already existing building which are on the verge of complete destruction? Well, if a building is on the verge of complete destruction, one needs to then evaluate, do you allow the structure to be um, completely demolished or is there some inherent value in the structure that's still standing. And I think if you were to be asking me of that question in Venice, where you've got lots of age of buildings that actually has a story to tell, an element of heritage that needs to be preserved, then I would fight tooth and nail to ensure that it is preserved and be given a new lease of life through the adaptive reuse. But if there is no inherent cultural or heritage value, and the property is derelict, and the property has no immediate function for the immediate generation, then I see no reason why it should not be um, removed in order to actually create a new piece of infrastructure that is good for the people now, but also provides future flexibility for future generations. Okay. So the next question is, what is the importance of location in the sustainable building? Location is everything and also so is climate. And basically I would go on two C's, climate, culture, 
and two P's, people and place. What's going to be incredibly important is to ensure, first of all, you understand the climate of the place, what the prevailing wind direction is, what the temperature is, the annual precipitation, and also understand the culture of the people. Who live there? What is the social demographic? Why do they live there? and how you can actually then draw the essence from the climate and the culture of the people to create something that is truly, truly positive placemaking. Okay, so the next question is generally the uh, uh, initial cost of construction of a sustainable building is high and it requires a high level of expertise and special kind of material. Then how can one build sustainable buildings in a rural areas where these facilities are not available? The question's incorrect. Sustainable buildings are not more expensive. Um, so I'm not quite sure where that question comes from. We need to bear in mind that heritage buildings, conventional buildings, whether it's the Kampong in Southeast Asia or the traditional Victorian terrace houses of London, were ostensibly um, very easy to construct. They embraced natural light and natural ventilation. They were all about passive design. Sustainable design is affordable design. It's only when you have architects who like to stick solar panels and wind turbines on the roof or create something that looks fanciful that people have this misconception that sustainable design is costly. I've designed the first carbon negative house in Asia, which actually was the same cost as an average home in Malaysia. So I would say that there is every chance for us to be creating sustainable properties, buildings and cities that are affordable in order to debunk the myth that sustainable design is costly design. Uh, the next question is the United Nations is planning to achieve net carbon emission to be zero. So how can we contribute to that and what are your views on the same? Basically carbon zero effectively means trying to ensure that you offset the same amount of energy that you are consuming by looking at clean energy sources. That could be solar, could be wind, could be geothermal, could be tidal. So ultimately, if the mandate of cities and their governments are to push towards a zero carbon future, it should be something that everyone should be embracing. The fear is it doesn't go far enough. Our consumption on a daily basis outstrips any means of us trying to create zero carbon cities and buildings in order to try and preserve uh, the, the goodness for our future generations. We need to be going towards carbon negativity, where we generate surplus clean energy through alternative methods, solar, wind, so on and so forth. If we are to try and create a sustainable future for our children. Uh, the next question is, what techniques or methods the smart cities uses uh, so it can reduce uh, carbon emission and tackle the global warming? I think I covered some of those in the, uh, in the lecture there. So I'm sure okay. that's probably a question that came before the lecture. Yes. Uh, so the next question is, uh, there are two options few completely sustainable buildings, and the other option is large number of incomplete sustainable buildings. So which one is better and practically possible? Sorry, can you start that question again? So do you want to me, uh, repeat the question again? Yes, okay. please. Yes. Uh, my question is, few completely sustainable buildings, and other option is large number of incomplete sustainable buildings. So which one is better and practically possible? <laughs> Are you saying a few number of completed sustainable buildings or lots of incomplete sustainable buildings? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, that's a bit of a weird question, isn't it? I mean, the assumption is that if you're going to incomplete the building and it's practically incomplete, then it would not be habitable. So what's the point of actually building it in the first place? I think ultimately everybody should be getting out of bed to do the right thing. And if we are training as architects, we don't want to be keeping our ideas on paper. We don't want to be just these paper visionaries who are trying to talk about sustainable futures, but not actually get anything completed. At the same time, we don't want to be simply builders who create 
buildings, but do not consider the consequences of our actions that might not be so sustainable. So I think it's about striking the balance between the two. Let's try and work in the realms of reality, apply the lessons learned that we know well, passive design, natural light, natural ventilation, the use of locally sourced materials, thinking about circular concepts to reduce waste, up, you know, upscaling and, up, uh, and recycling. And at the same time, ensure that these practical elements can be applied to our cities, our buildings and landscapes to ensure that they are completed to make a sustainable future. Oh, stunned silence, sorry. Have I said too much? Um, is that it? Yes, so, sorry again. That was network issue. So uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so thank you so much for the session. And sir, we have uh, Yudi Patel, sir, who is actually at our faculty of civil engineering and environmental science. So, sir, I request one of my team member to make him co-host of the event, and uh, he want to ask some questions. So yes, I request sure. sir to ask some questions for the same. Uh, so, uh, Dhruv, please make UD Patel, sir, the co-host of the... Yes, event. Krishna, I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yes, UD Patel, UD Patel, sir, is not here, I think. Hello, uh, Patel, sir. So you are not audible. So uh, your voice is not audible. So please try to mute and then unmute your mic. Side. Sir, your video is visible, but you are not audible here. Maybe we can um, have the question. Sir, so you are not clearly. Sorry? Uh, UD Patil, sir, he's not audible. Yeah, um, so maybe can you go to He's back, maybe. Hello? Yes, sir, UD Patil, sir? Sir, you are not audible here. Um, maybe we can try and get uh, sir, uh, hello? Uh, leave the meeting and uh, try to next. No, sir, Jason, sir, for not you, it was for UD Patel, sir. Um, well, okay. are there any other questions? No, sir, from participant side, uh, the questions are over. Okay, yes, sir. So thank you so much to be part of our event you, for and for your valuable time.
thank you so much sir and thank you so much to participants also who were so patient during this session thank you so much everyone appreciate it take yeah. care everybody thank you sir bye bye yeah